or volleyball, basketball, something. Uh, it could be uh, any number of things that we have in our lives that we just want to get better at. And we begin to work on it, and eventually we begin to get a skill in that area. Those skills in our, area, in our lives, though, those avocations for most of us, um, are really secondary to who we are, though, as Christians. You know, today's message centers around the skill of living the Christian life. What are we doing in our Christian life to build skill in living out the Christian life? Not only in church on Sunday morning, but when we go to work, or if we're retired and we're not going to work, or we're in school, school year's about to start up again, what does that Christian life look like? What skills are we building? What are the things in our lives that we're working on to try to hone in, to learn from our mistakes, to learn from others, and to increase our ability and our skill in our Christian life? And so that's what I would like us to talk about today. I'm going to speak from Galatians 3. You'll read Galatians 3, verses 1 through 5. And Paul says this to the Galatians. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he, who supply, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Let's pray. Our Father, we ask again that you would bless this time as we look into your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would do his work of using your word in our lives to conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be a people who take seriously the Christian life, who are not fools, but are wise, wise in this world, according to your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So in your bulletin this morning are four points. I'm not going to preach four points. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to even try. Uh, we're going to I'm going to use the first point to review um, what we've talked about so far in the book of Galatians. It's been over the course of about, what, five years or something that I've been preaching through the book of Galatians here. So uh, we will use the first point to review that a little bit. But the second, that's the spirit and salvation. The second point, the spirit and sanctification, that's where I'd like us to spend the majority of our time today. Um, and then the, the last two points on the spirit and the suffering and spirit and serving, um, I'm not going to touch on today, but they're from the passage, and I'll point that out uh, at the end here. So Paul opens this up, uh, and as, uh, as you recall, by way of review, because I say this every time I'm up here, you should be tired of it by now, uh, and I, in a way I hope you are, but the letter of the Galatians, Paul is doing, he's got two purposes for writing the letter to the, to the Galatian churches. And you should know this by now, I hope. One is to defend the one true gospel. There is one and only one gospel. And Paul is defending that one true gospel. And two, Paul is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's number 13, but he is an apostle. And his apostolic ministry was questioned uh, in Galatia. So you remember the, the historical context. Paul goes on his first missionary journey. He goes through the, re the region of Galatia. He starts a bunch of churches in the little towns as he, as he worked his way through. And then he moved on. Then Judaizers, people who were of a Jewish origin, came in these Gentile churches and said, Paul did not preach to you the true gospel. Not only must you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for your sins, for forgiveness of sins, but you must also keep certain parts of the law, the parts that we tell you to keep. So there was an and. You must do this, and you must do that. 
You must believe and you must do something. So that's what they were teaching. And so the people were confused. They were Gentiles who just received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior through Paul's uh, preaching. And that's all they had to do. And they said, but wait a minute, Paul was an apostle. How can you say that what he taught us was wrong? And the Judaizer said, oh, he wasn't one of the, the apostles. We've been to Jerusalem. We know the 12 apostles. Paul's not one of them. He's not from Jerusalem. So they wrote to Paul right away, and they said, Did, what's going on? They were confused. So Paul is defending the fact that he is a true apostle, and he's defending the one true gospel. And so he says to them in verse three, or chapter three, he addresses them and says, uh, and up to this point, he's been really defending um, his uh, apostolic authority. Uh, and in verse, in chapter three, he says, "O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you?" Okay, so in other words, he says, "You have become fools." Now, this isn't a nice term. We don't normally walk around calling people fools. Uh, but this is the opposite of wise. The word foolish here is the opposite of the word wise. He says, you have become foolish. You were wise, but now you are fools. And the idea of bewitched is someone cast a spell on you. Who blinded you? To the truth that you had already accepted. How is it that you are so quickly confused by this wrong teaching? He says, Jesus, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So in Paul's ministry, and Barnabas was there with him as well, they taught the people about Christ's crucifixion. They said, we told you about Christ's crucifixion. It is sufficient it's all you need for forgiveness of sins. You can't add anything to, you can't contribute anything to your own salvation. Christ is enough. And so this is what, how he starts. So he starts with these questions, these four questions. And that's where the four points of the outline come from. So he says, let me ask you, ask you this. And the first question is the it's the most important one. All the other questions follow from it. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, we learned up in chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 15, uh, verse 16, that uh, Paul says a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So justification by faith alone, in Christ, uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay, those three little prepositions are very uh, are the truth of the gospel. We are saved by God's grace. He has no reason to save us. We are sinners. He's holy. He has no reason to save us. The fact that he forgives us our sins, the fact that he even offers us forgiveness of sins, the fact that Jesus even died for our sins, Romans 3 says, is really an incredible thought in and of itself. Why would a holy God go through everything that he went through simply to redeem sinful mankind? Men and women who go around the world hating him. Why would he do that? It's by his grace that we are saved. But it is through our faith in Christ that we are saved. And no, nothing else to be added to that. So we go again back to Romans 5, 17. Whoever receives the free gift, what's the free gift? The free gift of grace, the forgiveness of sins. It's a free gift. And it's that easy to accept it. I'm quite certain that after the message, when everyone goes out to have cake, and someone hands you a piece of cake, you aren't going to try to do something to earn the cake. The cake is a free gift. All you do is walk up there and take it. And it seems rather too simplistic, but it really is that simple to accept the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins, and that he was raised the third day. 
And you can have forgiveness of sins and you can have peace with God by simply accepting the free gift. It really is that simple. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, but in Christ alone. In other words, there is nothing that we can add to it. Christ is sufficient. If we think that we can do something to help our case, like if, you know, like if you think that if you walked on your knees out there to get cake, you would be more deserving, no. If you think you have to put money in the offering plate or in the, in the back in order to get cake, no. It doesn't work that way. If you have to stop and pray five times before you go and take your piece of cake, no. The cake is free. There's nothing you can do to pay for it. It's paid for. You just go and take it. And so it is with our salvation. It's through Christ alone. And if we try to add anything to that, or if we take anything away from that, we have a false gospel. And this is one of the most important things that we have to, as believers, hold on to today, is to make sure that we never give up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by, by allowing someone to come in and take, uh, add something to it or detract from it. And I've said it before, if someone gets up here and starts preaching a false gospel, I would expect every man in here to come up here and physically carry that person out of the building and throw them out in the driveway. Or a snowbank, eight months out of the year. It's that important. So, the Apostle Paul here, in this paragraph specifically points out the work of the Holy Spirit. He says, Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So the Holy Spirit plays a role in this. Now, when we talk about salvation, there's a lot that happens when a person is saved. And so what do theologians do? Theologians like to break it all into pieces so we can kind of look at it you know, each part by itself. But in reality, that doesn't happen. In reality, things happen so quickly that we don't understand them. We can't understand them. Our minds are too slow. But he says here that the, we receive the Holy Spirit. The moment that we accept, we say this, we accept Christ as our Savior, uh, we also get the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has a number of ministries that he does for us in this age, in the age of the church. Pa Pastor has been talking about this in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. So this actually kind of dovetails nicely with that. But one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he indwells the believer. He also seals the believer. He is the seal for the believer. Ephesians chapter 1, I'll just flip over and read this very quickly. Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 13 and 14. In him, that's in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is our guarantee or our down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We receive the Holy Spirit who then becomes our seal. And once you have this seal, by the way, you cannot lose it. So God has given us the Holy Spirit at the moment that we're saved. And how do we get the Holy Spirit? By faith. We receive him when we receive Christ as our Savior. We also get the Holy Spirit. And that is only by faith. There's nothing we can do to work for it. So what is the point of, of this? God has made us sinners. We are all sinners. God has made us sinners in order to save us for his glory. Our salvation is is not for our benefit. We didn't deserve it. It's for God's glory. We benefit. Don't worry. We benefit. But we benefit because we are saved for His glory, not for our own glory, not for our own status, but so that we can have fellowship with Him. 
This is why God has saved us. And when he saves us, he gives us the Holy Spirit. So our salvation, when we are saved by faith, by grace, through faith in Christ, we also receive the Holy Spirit. And Paul is arguing that if you received the Holy Spirit by faith, and not by works, you didn't do anything to earn it, there was no, here, say this prayer and you get the Holy Spirit. No. Uh, say this prayer, or do this thing and you will, you will be saved, and then the Holy Spirit will come. No. It was by faith. And they had received the Holy Spirit by faith, and they knew that. So he starts his argument with this. Now the second point, and where I'd like to spend uh, the rest of our time, is the Spirit and sanctification. So he says, if you received the Spirit when you were saved, that's the first point number one, and they did, by the way, that's the answer to the question. He says, having begun... Well, verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish? He asks the question again. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? All right, so I'm saved. One of the things that happens when I'm saved is I receive the Holy Spirit. He comes to me also and indwells me, and he seals me. And both of those things are from that point in time until the time I see Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, both Ephesians 1 and Galatians 3 are saying the same thing. He, in this case, he uses this. He began, he began. So you receive the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit, Spirit begins to do something in us. And he's going to continue doing that thing in us until there's no more work to be done in us. That's what it means by perfected. He says, having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected, <clears throat> perfected by the flesh? So what he's talking about now is the Christian life. Well, you are saved by faith, but now you have to live your life by works. And so you, now you have to, you have to do things uh, to, to make yourself holy now that you're saved. Right? Now, now you have to work it out. And the, the, the contrast between faith and works in the Christian life, the Bible talks about this in both ways. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you're probably very familiar with. Um, but if we look, add verse 10 to it, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, why? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God prepared for beforehand the good works that we should be doing. He created us, he saved us, so that we would do good things. Am I sanctified? Am I made more holy? By doing good works? Well, Paul seems to indicate in chapter 3 that the answer to that is no. So, how do we understand this? How do we put these two things together? Hebrews says I need to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, for example. How, what do you mean I have to work it out? So there are some various views on this idea of sanctification. The short answer is sanctification is becoming more holy over the span of my lifetime. I'll, just, I'll quote from the Baptist Catechism. Sanctification is the work of God's Spirit. That's what Paul says right here in Galatians 3. 3. Whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die to sin and to live to righteousness. So we have, we're still sinners, but now there is a struggle. But we have the Holy Spirit who will help us in the struggle to live a more righteous life, to uh, turn away from sin, and to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit does 
in us. Now, some people will teach then, well, if sanctification, this idea I can become more holy, is by faith, as Paul says here in Galatians 3.3, 3, and not by works, then what I have to do is I have to sit and in a passive way, just let the Holy Spirit change me. Okay? Completely passive way. Well, there's, some, there's a couple problems with that. How does that work out with the verse that says I have to work out my faith in fear and trembling? How does that work with Ephesians 2.10, where I am saved for good works? Those seem to be very active, not very passive. <clears throat> there's another view. There's many views. As many theologians as you have, you have twice as many views, right? So there's another view that says, no, if I sin, I have to question my salvation. So I have to sanctify myself by my good works. And there are some who would teach that. Um, but that goes against what Paul's saying here in, in Galatians 3. The Holy Spirit does this work in me, and I do this by faith. So how does this work? How, does this, how do we grow in Christ? How do we become more like Christ? How do we grow mature in our Christian life as if it were a skill that we need to work on? So God has, he's, he's taken us sinners and he wants to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. And he wants us to do it for his glory. So how does, what does this look like? What do we do with this? Well, here's an analogy, and I don't know how good of an analogy it is, but we'll try it. So Galatians 5, we haven't, I won't preach this message yet. <laughs> In another 10 years, maybe I'll preach this one. But Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay, fruits of the Spirit. Most of us probably have those memorized. It's a good list if you don't have it memorized. It's a good list to memorize. So let's look at patience. So, as a believer, <laughs> most people are like, no, no, don't, please don't tell me to pray for patience. We know what happens when we pray for patience. Yes, we do. And I'll talk about that. Um, let's say you're reading through the scriptures and you come across that, and maybe it's a sermon like this, maybe it's a, something else the pastor's preaching on 1 Corinthians 13, for example, on love. This is really good. Love is patient. Okay, so we'll just tuck it right into pastor's series there. Um, the Holy Spirit, my conscience, the Word of God, somebody convicts me that I need to be more patient. And I'll be honest with you, this is something I've been working on specifically in my life over the last few years. Why? Because I've had failure. That's why. And I've said to myself, Christians are patient. And the Holy Spirit is in me to make me patient. But I've, I've failed. I've failed miserably. And so I need to work on the skill of being more patient. Now, how do I do that? Well, Paul says these things are by faith. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that it's by faith? Well, I think on the one hand, by faith means simply this. When I wake up in the morning and I put my feet on the ground, or even before I put my feet on the ground, I have some truths of the Word of God that I can claim. The Holy Spirit is in me. Galatians 3, verse 2. And if the Holy Spirit is in me, which I believe by faith, I, I receive that by faith, he is in me, then he is going to work patience out through me. I have everything I need to be a patient person. Right there, in that one biblical truth. Because Galatians 5.22 tells me, the Holy Spirit is working through me, I'm going to be patient. And guess what happens? If I'm doing something to not allow the Holy Spirit to work through me, I'm not going to be patient. So by faith, yes, I accept that. Now, what do I have to do? I have to exercise that. I have to test that. 
One of the things I learned about woodworking, it's perhaps the most important thing you need with, when working with wood is sh a sharp blade. It's got to be sharp. So what do you have to learn how to do? Sharpen blades. <laughs> and if you're not good at that, well, then it's just miserable. How do you know if your blade is sharp? Well, I can sharpen my blade. I could run a piece of paper over it. I've cut my fingers on them. Yep, they're sharp. How do I know that it's sharp? Until I take it to a piece of wood. And I test it. Is it sharp? Is it sharp enough? Is it sharp straight? I've done that before. Why isn't this cutting right? It's sharp. Oh yeah, but it's not straight. Okay. So now I have to test that skill. And that's what we don't like, right? Why don't we want to pray for patience? Because something's going to happen to test our patience. And is that fun? Is that what we like? No. So what can I do then if I want to claim these truths that the Holy Spirit can work out patience through me? One is when a situation arises, I don't run away. I have the inner courage, I have the strength to face the challenge that comes to me to say, hey, here's a conflict, are you going to run away? Or are you going to patiently handle it? Or are you going to patiently run away? Maybe that's an option. No, I can deal with it. Why can I deal with it? Because by faith, I know that the Holy Spirit can work through me in this situation to be patient. So I have to, I have to pray. I have to rely on the Holy Spirit. I have to have that faith that he will do that. And I have to not get in the way. But then what happens? The other side of it has to happen, right? Where I actually have to show patience. I have to actually not lose my temper. I actually have to not sin anger, in anger. We can call it, uh, you know, irritability. You can call it uh, uh, losing your temper. Okay, but if we use the biblical term for it, you're being angry in a sinful manner. That's what the Bible calls that. I don't want to do that. So then there's other things that I'm going to do. For example, I found one time that taking a, a particular cold medicine makes me very irritable. Like, terrible. I have no patience whatever. In fact, I almost feel like I don't have control over my own emotions. When I recognize that, I've never taken that cold medicine again. It's better for me to suffer with the symptoms of the cold and be patient than it is to take some medicine that's supposed to heal me but makes me sin. What's more important? So, by faith I accept the fact that the Holy Spirit is there. He's there to help me. He works through me. He works through patience through me. But then there are other things that I can do to make things worse. I can worry about things, run things through my mind. And you know what normally happens when you try to run things through your mind. All of a sudden it's like, nope, I should, nope, if that happens, I'm not going to say that. That's just going to escalate the situation. You know, anger and patience are very different, right? Anger is a, a very strong emotion that's kind of opposite of patience. And if I escalate the situation and raise the emotions, I'm going to make the situation worse. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to say those words. I don't want to act in that way. If this situation arises, can I confront it? Yes, I can confront it. But how will I do it? How will I do that wisely? And so sometimes when we look at a, a, a situation like that, we say, okay, well, I want to I wanna be more patient. Yeah, 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 patience. How long does it take to learn that? Um, I want to learn that right now. Uh, how do we do it? I mean, yeah, the Bible says we should be more patient. We, we, we read the Gospels. We see where Jesus was very patient in the story of the 5,000. His disciples weren't patient. Can we send these people home because we don't have food for them and we're hungry and want to eat? 
Jesus says, no. No, let's feed them. Jesus showed his patience often throughout his life. And I can look at that and I can study that and say, this is how it looked in Jesus' life. And I can do that. Another very practical way is I can say, here is a person in my life I know who is very patient. They're always very patient with me. I see them be patient with other people. Is there a way that I can just spend time with that person so that some of that will rub off on me so I can learn more about that? Yes. What if I don't know how to start? Call your pastor. Talk to an older woman or older man in the church and say, I'm a younger man or a younger woman in the church and I, I need to work on this. Can you help me? And the older men and older women might be like, I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, but I see this in your life and I want you to share it with me. And they're like, I don't know how I did it. And then, and then he's, well, just let me, you know, spend time with you so I can see it in action when it happens. And I can learn from you just from your example. Uh, those are good things. When we talk about biblical counseling, this is what biblical counseling looks like. Here's how you live out what God expects from you. What Paul is making here is, is this argument that the people of God have been given the Holy Spirit and we received him by faith and by faith we allow him to turn us into the image of God but there is something that we need to do. We need to exercise that. We need to test that. We need to be not afraid to fail. We need to learn from our, from our failures. We need to learn from others who are exemplary. We need to do something. But the point is, we need to do something. You know, we spend a lot of time growing in skills in other areas of our lives. Some of us have to do this for work. Some of us do it for fun. Some of you like math. Some of you don't. Some of you like sports. Some of you don't. Someone asked, you know, in an interview, asked one of the top soccer players in the world, well, it must be nice that you were given so much, you know, physical advantage. And he just looked at the, the reporter, and he does have a lot of physical advantage, and he just looked at the reporter and said, we practice a lot. We train all the time. The amount of sleep we get, the food we eat, everything is one goal, to be a better soccer player. Whether or not we have the physical ability is beside the point. That has really little to do with it. It's what we do other than that. So the challenge today from Galatians 3 is how do you look at your Christian life? Do we look at our Christian life the same way? Do we look at, like uh, pastors been preaching in 1 Corinthians 13, when it says that love doesn't envy or isn't jealous of other people. Do we look at our lives then and say, do I have jealousy? Do I have envy here towards other people? Towards another person in particular, not just towards other people. You'll never have anything towards other people. Is there someone in my life that I'm jealous of because of this or that? 